All right, well, I'm going to just jump in here. Uh, so I'm Stephen Mursky. Uh, I'm a research scientist with USDA and ARS in Beltsville, Maryland, so not very far from here. Um, you know, we don't, we don't, we're, we're kind of huddled away over there in ARS. You know, we don't have these uh, big extension and outreach appointments, you know, like a lot of the folks at the universities have. And so we, we, we come to these types of events. We do do some on-farm research for sure, and we're, we're working with growers in the region. Uh, but it, it's certainly a, a, a more of a challenge for us to be as visible. So I, I'm kind of, today, I, I've, been, I mean, I've been a part of this meeting and working with this group now for about eight or nine years. We've been writing grants to help support this uh, venue and, and keep this going. And so I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I haven't presented at this event in a number of years. So I thought what I would use today for is more to just kind of gloss over a bunch of themes. Uh, we do a lot of work on this subject. We've been working on organic uh, agriculture for many, many years at Beltsville. We have a long history of, of field crop production research in organic agriculture. So any of these themes that I gloss over, we ha often have large research programs addressing a lot of these different themes. And so come up to me afterwards, feel free to call me, contact me, you know, Stephen Mursky, USDA, it'll come right up and you'll find my contact information and we can kind of get into some of the nitty gritty and nuts and bolts of some of these specific questions. But for today, again, I'm gonna just gloss over some of these themes, especially, you know, I'm, I'm covering, uh, what's, I gotta find which, I don't think I'm gonna have a laser pointer today, am I? None of this is speaking the same language. Okay, no big deal. Let me just figure out how to get out of this. Okay, so um, I'm covering nitrogen and weeds. That's kind of hard to do and the role of cover crops in managing that. So I'm gonna kind of bounce around a bunch of different themes. But I thought I would give a little bit of a, a big picture tone to start things off, right? So a lot of the thinking that's gone in to our current production paradigm is, is this issue that happened many, many years ago, right? The Dust Bowl that influenced so much of our thinking, so many of our regulatory policies and, and actions since has been a result of that. And, and obviously one of the big success stories was the development of no-till grain production. And the focus was largely soil conservation but based, right? And another strategy, I'm not saying it was completely exclusively linked to the Dust Bowl. Obviously, there's other factors that, that drove the organic uh, movement, but a big part of soil conservation and more importantly, soil building and regenerative farming, uh, organic uh, agriculture came out of those same themes is that we were having problems uh, conserving and managing our soil resources. And so these are two strategies that are intertwined. And what I would like to propose, since I'm giving a talk all about nitrogen and weeds and cover crops, that I think they're very intertwined that you know, they're both kind of focusing on this new theme, soil health, something we called many years ago, soil conservation and then soil quality. And now soil health is the new buzzword, but all kind of similar concepts about how to manage our soils. And so these two systems are, 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 are proposed solutions to addressing that. And I would argue that both of them face this really big paradox, this challenge of managing the soil and managing the weeds. In the case of no-till grain production, very successful practice has you know, dramatically increased the amount of acreage that a given grower can, can manage, uh, reduce labor costs and all of that, but it's been coming at a cost of herbicide resistant weeds, uh, increased t tolerant herbicides, I mean increased total herbicide applications, and then also this is just a, uh, can be a more energy intensive system because of that. Um, and so weeds being a central theme there, that we're, we're conserving our soil by not tilling it, but it's requiring production practices that's resulted in a lot of resistance across the landscape. And then in organic, obviously weeds are also a central theme. And in there, a lot of how we deal with weeds is really intensive tillage. So constantly going across the field, nine or 10 different operations in the spring to manage, the, to, to plant the crop, to pr prepare the seed beds, to, to, to the blind cultivations that are three to five passes in the season and then two to three between row cultivations, all very intensive and, and uh, soil disturbance. And so there again, this interface between trying to conserve our soil resources and address our weed management. So I think that they kind of are connected in this way. And so cover crops really offer one of the uh, best strategies to addressing a lot of these concerns. The cover crops is just, 
I mean, every, I think probably everybody in this room knows what cover crops are or, or using cover crops. I mean, cover crops is anything that covers the ground, right? Your weeds are a cover crop if you didn't plant a cover crop, and that's covering the ground. So the only thing that we're doing in cover crop science and cover crop production and, and what we're trying to do is just increase the performance, whether that's an improved line or a certain species or combining species, all of that is just to maximize uh, the performance of that cover crop to achieve a given goal or objective that we have. And so this is what I would lay out and say that I think what, what we're looking for in a cover crop based system, right? We want to maximize profitability first and foremost, uh, certainly improve production efficiencies like nutrients, labor, and fuel, minimize pests, but then some of these broader benefits that are not, uh, not directly measurable, but increase conserving soil and water resources, enhancing ecosystem services. And then as we have more and more challenges with climate change, but when, you know, at the very least, more extreme weather events, droughts and floods, um, how can we develop cropping systems that are, are resilient and adaptive to those events? And so again, I think cover crops are a central element to all that. And I would ask folks in the room, you know, are, are we achieving what we set out to do with cover crops? Are they working for us? And from what I can tell, I, I, I interact with a lot of farmers and I, I work with a lot of folks all over the country on cover crops and, and I can say for certainty that we're not. We're barely scratching the surface of what we can do with cover crops, mainly because we still are in that production paradigm of plant it late, kill it early, throw whatever you know, seed you have out there. And so you know, you're, you're the, the, the quality of the management needs to increase, but also the genetics that we have. I keep wanting to point to my laser pointer that I don't have. Uh, you know, the quality of the genetics of so the germ plasm that we're working with, there's been virtually no improvement to this. You know, so we're talking, when we talk about a breeding program for corn, we're talking about massive, massive amounts of investments. And to make a change in corn at any level today, that requires a tremendous amount of resources because there's just been so much improvement. But cover crops have received none. There's been virtually no breeding whatsoever for improving cover crops. There's been some work on forages, and, and one could argue that many of the benefits we want from forages apply to what we want in our annual production systems. But I would argue that's not the case, right? There's many times that we don't want this very luscious material that is very digestible and very nutritious. Sometimes we want something that just sits around and has high carbon to nitrogen ratios and decays slowly and provides other benefits like weed suppression. So um, there needs to be ra ramped up efforts on that. And then the big one I think is variability and performance. And I'm gonna try to touch on a few of these before I give you some more examples about weeds and nitrogen management. Um, so one of the biggest concerns I have is misinformation. There's a lot of this one size fits all feedback folks are getting about cover crops. Now the, the quality of the material that's coming out is getting better. The universities are providing better support and better uh, bulletins and products. The, certainly uh, some of the companies are providing more information. Uh, ARS does a lot of research on cover crops as well. They're starting to become more products available online. But a lot of what I've seen with the challenges with folks with cover crops is that they try it. They have some poor success. They you know, try it one year, I didn't really like how that looked, and so they didn't try it again, or they didn't put it in a different field. Or there was something unique about what happened that year that there was some problems. And, and like we know in agriculture, everything varies from field to field, from year to year, and all, everything we do that's new it comes with a learning curve. And there's a lot of times that this information is not specific to the systems. Folks read something and it's this generic information about cover crops because cover crops is new and so we just think that this is a one size fits all management tool and it's not. You know, cover crops are a biological tool, just like planting your crop. It behaves the same way as every, everything else is planted out there, has the same interactions with the environment, and it's going to be very contingent on your system, right? If you're, if you're focusing on fertility or soil management, if you're in orchards or vegetables or grains, all of those affect the type of information you need about cover crops. So I, I guess I encourage folks to seek out much more regionally specific, much more localized information and work with your, you know, like University of Maryland, uh, ARS, uh, our location. We do a ton of cover crop research uh, at Bark right around the corner from here and happy to communicate with any of you about uh, what we've learned or come out and see our, our research and, and talk about that. 
I am pleased to say that there is now a, a, a national effort to start breeding cover crops. So uh, last year, uh, I was the uh, project director of a grant that was a national team of folks, uh, breeders, agronomists, soil scientists, plant physiologists all coming together uh, to develop a, a, a legume breeding program. And it's national in scope. So we have breeders uh, all over the country, a hairy vetch, crimson clover, and uh, Austrian winter pea. So we felt like there was a lot of good grass material out there, but particularly in, in the organic realm, which was what our funding stream was from, or REI, mm -hmm. legumes are one of the central components of your systems, right? And, and the success of the legume drives the success of your, your management long term. So we thought that that was the best place to start. So we're, we have uh, a certain key traits that we're targeting, certainly winter hardiness, uh, drought tolerance, uh, rapid emergence and growth, high biomass production. Uh, in the case of hairy vetch, we're trying to breed out the hard seed concerns because we think hairy vetch is a really good cover crop, but certainly we know that everybody in this room probably doesn't like a hairy vetch, right? the vast majority of you. <laughs> we got one, all right, good, one fan. I love hairy vetch, but certainly know that it comes with a lot of baggage. Um, so anyway, uh, we have this program and, and this is what it looks like in scope. So um, we have these three stations here, Cornell, uh, Bark, uh, and then uh, North Carolina State University, where we're doing some of the, the majority of the breeding work. And then we have on-farm participatory breeding that's going on all throughout the Midwest, where we have a postdoc housed out there and a team, the Harry Vetch breeder is at this location here, and we're gonna be doing on-farm participatory breeding throughout. Uh, in this region, we will have farmer-engaged breeding, where so growers are going to be coming on site to be doing screenings and evaluations of our lines so that we're making sure that we're catering to the farming community. We have a farmer in this room who will be participating, but I certainly want it to encourage broader participation. So we're looking for folks to, to help serve on this panel and, and, and work with us. So it would be coming to bar bark maybe once or twice in the growing season and doing visual ratings of these legume cover crops based on what you're looking for on your farm, the traits of interest in your farm. So we're hoping to have this farm participatory screening before we do the selection process. So if you're interested in cooperating with me on this, please contact me, I would love to have you as part of this. And then the neat part of this collaboration, really what I think is the, 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 the more than the icing on the cake, what's really gonna drive this across the country is having the plant material centers involved. So folks know the plant material centers? Most people don't know what the plant material centers are. Oh, okay, good. All right, so NRCS, you all know who NRCS is, um, has a, a, a component to their, uh, that agency called the plant material centers. And the plant material centers have involved in all sorts of efforts over decades on improving you know, the, the kinds of plants that you see on your roadsides, on the highways, versus introducing new lines, testing germplasm, screening them. They're basically a one-stop shop for screening germplasm and they were in very regional specific. So their mandates have not been coordinated across the country. Generally, what, what's going on over here has nothing to do with what's going on over here, nothing to do with what's going on over here. And they've been, they were struggling the last couple of years and, and the shift that happened in, this la in the last couple of years was that now they're taking on more of a united effort. And so I'm working closely with them right now. We're testing about 10 different species of cover crops and testing and screening all of the commercially available lines across the whole country. Not just the northern locations, which you see here, which is part of this project, but all of the locations. Uh, but then the next phase of this project will be then to move these new lines and, and start testing them at the plant material centers across the country. So I think it's an, a, an exciting opportunity to start to see a, a dramatic shift in cover crops and the consistency of their performance. And so when I talk about regionally specific information, you know, I think this, we all know this in the room, this is just not the way things work in agriculture. You can't make a prescription for regions of the scale. We need much smaller regions, and even the Northeast is not a reasonable scale in which to be making recommendations. But what we are doing that I um, also wanted to uh, share with everybody in the room is we're forming uh, this year the Northeast Cover Crop Council. And so this is something else for everybody to be aware of. Uh, has anybody heard of the Midwest Cover Crop Council? Just raise your hand if you heard of the Midwest Cover Crop Council. One person in the room. Okay. Wow. All right. This is great. Uh, so the Midwest Cover Crop Council, it was set up uh, uh, about five or seven years ago. I don't remember the exact uh, date. Um, and it's a cluster of, of states all, all around the Midwest and the Great Plains region that developed 
kind of this cooperation to have an annual meeting and to network growers, researchers, uh, ag professionals, and provide web-based decision support. Uh, so uh, species selection tools, you go online and it's, very, it's county specific. So for every county in the Midwest of all the states that are participating, you can get county specific information about selecting your cover crops, the, how to combine cover crops, what are the seeding rates, planting dates, all the kinds of information that goes into managing cover. So I'm pleased to announce that over the last couple of years I've been working diligently to get funding around this and we now have the resources to initiate the Northeast Cover Crop Council. Our first meeting is going to be the uh, in March 31st and April 1st and this is more of a kind of an intimate uh, closed door meeting. We will have representatives from every state in the Northeast. Uh, we'll have seed companies, industry, uh, machinery companies, uh, NRCS, so health initiative folks, as well as um, um, growers throughout the region. So it's a more of an intimate uh, group to first kind of define what this is going to look like and how we're going to take the steps to, to execute this. But we also uh, plan on after this year, then it would open up broadly. And this would be an annual conference in the region that anybody would be welcome to come and participate and network with both ag professionals, researchers, other growers. Um, we're going to be doing data synthesis across the region. So there's lots of people doing this kind of work, but not cooperatively. So we want to kind of synthesize all this information about cover crops, uh, define what these knowledge gaps might be, address those knowledge gaps, and then develop these decision support tools to provide county-specific information to growers all throughout the Northeast. And simultaneously, while this is going on, I'm collaborating with a group that's doing the same thing in the Southeast. So there's, there's going to be interplay there too, particularly for Maryland folks who we kind of span that Southeast to Northeast much more so than Maine or New York does. And so we, there'll be interests from folks in this room to go down and interact with the North Carolina and the Virginia group and as such. Okay, so I'm um, just kind of reviewing briefly some of the cover crops that uh, I'll talk about, you know, that, that, that I think are important components of these organic systems and, and, and some of the applications. Legumes certainly are king. The success of the legume in organic uh, crop production and, and most of my talk is all going to be catered towards field crop production so corn and soybean um, so in the case of corn you know legume management is key because it, it, it optimizes the amount of nitrogen you're putting in and and it's dr the, the performance of your legume cover crop directly translates into how much poultry litter or dairy manure you're going to be adding to supplement and certainly we know in the Chesapeake Bay we have nutrient concerns about how much manure we can apply uh, in the case of Mineral fertilizers, they certainly have much slower release rates. There are lower energy use associated with it. Uh, it's a renewable resource that's not as relevant to most of the folks in this room. Uh, but as far as animal waste goes, certainly we don't, we're not adding new phosphorus, and that's the big one, is, is that the, the better our legume is doing, the, the more in balance our phosphorus is going to be. And then certainly we don't have the transport costs of hauling all of that waste and, and the different moisture contents of those wastes and those concerns and the volatility. Grasses are the, are the general workhorse of cover crops across the country. That's what most folks are using right now because the early adoption outside of organic was mostly just for erosion control. And so that's why grasses are so much more widely used. Really organic producers are the dominant ones who are, are much using much more diversified uh, cover crops. Uh, but you know they're winter, more winter hardy, very aggressive nitrogen scavengers, and really provide really good weed suppression. So when we think about variability in performance, I, I, I can't stress this enough. Is that you know I, I I think that one of the biggest issues we have with cover crops is the level of care that we need to put into them. Um, you know th there's a learning curve with the kind of performance you want to get out of a cover crop, but everything. It, that goes into having a successful corn crop in a given year applies to the cover crop as well, right? It, it, it experiences the same types of constraints, nutrients, light, fertility. It, when you have a field that's ponding like this one below, this was a field that was covered in a cover crop and most of that cover crop died because there was such wet conditions and it didn't get planted timely. So all of these kinds of factors matter. And so I have this little schematic that I made that kind of illustrates that point, that the success of the cover crop is based on your planting methods, site-specific management, nutrient inputs, the genetics, the species composition, mixtures versus monocultures, how weedy something can be like hairy vetch, uh, the costs of those seeds. So all of these things kind of drive 
their performance. And if you're not queuing in to all those details, the benefits that you're looking for from that cover crop is going to be is going to be hindered greatly. So now let's get into some more nuts and bolts of, of, of the talk and probably what most folks came here to, to see. So establishment method is really one of the biggest factors driving the success. I think that's what everybody is struggling with or, 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 or it's some kind of a constraint. I know there's folks in the room who are flying seed on. Um, uh, you know, uh, folks are looking at interseeding of cover crops, trying to get the seed in the ground before the cash crop is terminated. So aerial seeding has certainly been one of the, the common approaches in this region, flying on clover into a soybean at leaf drop, for example. Uh, but there's some newer technologies that are coming online beyond aerial seeding. Hey, Bill, here's a picture for, for your behalf. I don't know where I even got this picture, but I've had it for forever. I don't, I'm not sure who gave it to me. <laughs> Um, not it's not you. <laughs> I, I was, I've always wondered that because I, I, it's not, my plane. It's not your plane. Okay. But th that's your beans, right? <laughs> All right. And so, you know, now there's high boy options and there's even, you know, there's, you can contract out now and, and get, you know, high boy seedings into your system to come in and at when the corn is mature to get that seed there. But again, while this is certainly a next uh, step technology that has a lot of benefits, the reality of it is, is just like everything else out there, we know that the better seed to soil contact you have, the, more, the firmer that seed is placed in that seed bed, the better emergence you're gonna get. And so now other technologies are starting to come out, uh, like pieces of equipment that you know, at your last cultivation will be spinning on seed so that you're putting that seed down right there at that last cultivation. Uh, all of these technologies are just trying to get seed to the soil surface, or if not, better yet, drilled. And so this is now a piece of technology we've been working with for the last three or four years. I'm pretty excited about this piece of equipment. Um, it's, it's just like everything you already know. It's a drill. Just a couple of gangs were removed, right? You just don't have these units right here where the corn row goes. And now you can drill three rows of a cover crop in between your cash crop, and that's what it looks like. This is a picture uh, taken you know, from our sites, and this is what these covers look like in corn. Now, I don't want to say that this is totally working just yet. We still have a lot of bugs to work out. This, again, this talk today is more to kind of just share with you a lot of different things we have going on that I'd be happy to provide more specifics to you at another date. But the big challenges we're seeing, for example, is when we harvest the corn. So once we harvest the corn, we're, sh we're spreading all this chaff all over the place. And a lot of times on a very big, e at a big yielding, and a, and a year with a big yield, uh, we'll have all that residue smother the cover crop. So we'll get these great emergence and they'll come up, you know, at V5, V7 stage. We can come in at like, you know, at side dress time and we can get really good establishment. And then it just kind of hunkers down there and hangs out. We're mostly working with the most of the species that have worked for us. Uh, and don't boom me off the stage, annual ryegrass, uh, crimson clover, um, red clover, uh, those are the ones that, uh, ryegrass and, and red clover and crimson clover have been the ones that have had the most success because they have shade tolerance. They can hang out there, just kind of hunker down and wait till the cash crop is removed and they can get going. What I can't share with you, which is a little bit more disappointing, is on the soybean end. While the corn, we've had a bit of success. We have these issues with the stover. We're going to try to look at managing the stover to try to get less um, suppression of the, the cover crops at harvest, but the soybeans have been, at least in our region, a total failure. So as you go further north, it's working a little bit better, but down in Maryland, where we have a lot of heat units, we get fast growth rates of our soybeans. They can it be really quickly. We can get a flush that looks like this of the cover crop, but within a couple of weeks after canopying of that soybeans, you can't find a single cover crop uh, uh, plant out in the field. So we're losing them all because they just they're, they're, they don't have enough shade tolerance underneath the soybean canopy. Where I have gotten it to work, which has been quite successful, um, is in double crop beans. So if we move away from a 15 inch, or in the case of some folks who might be drilling, but we're, we're now planting our double crop beans and we're kind of comparing the yield uh, loss from, from planted 30 inch row spacing double crop beans versus 15 inch row spacing double crop beans. We expect over the years we might have some yield penalties there just because, you know, the later summer planting, you're trying to capture every drop of light that's out there to get that maximum yield. 
but we have gorgeous cover crops that are now being established. We can come in in August into a double crop beans and interseed in them. And since double crop beans never really canopy as well as, as a full season beans do, um, and especially at a 30 inch row spacing, we're now, we have beautiful grass legume cover crops coming out of soybeans. And at least from my perspective, and people tell me if, if you disagree, but at least from my perspective, the biggest challenge uh, in any all production systems, but, uh, but particularly in organic, getting that nitrogen you need for the falling corn phase is a real challenge if you're rotating out of soybeans. Because getting a legume after soybeans is almost impossible in our area, right? We, soybeans come out of the field so late it's hard to get a legume established. You can aerial seed it and hope that at leaf drop you get good take. And in some cases we do, and that's what folks are targeting. But another strategy here is in this double crop bean application, this is another way to get a legume to go into that corn phase to get that bump in nitrogen that you need so that you're kind of keeping track of, you know, keeping tabs on that, that phosphorus concerns with the manure. And then obviously other added benefits provides a forage by doing this interseeding, you get that in early enough that you can get a lot of growth that you can come in in the fall and have some added benefit if you've got animals in your system. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna switch in and, get, and, and talk specifically about uh, weeds and nitrogen as it relates to cover crops. So I, I, think I, I think the most important thing to stand back and when you talk about organic weed management in general, your first tool in the tool belt is always crop rotation. As soon as you diversify your crop rotations beyond just summer annuals, instead of just a corn soybean rotation, and you add a cereal into the rotation, or you're adding, I, you know, even, even more so adding you know, a, 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 a hay field in the rotation, that's when you start to have dramatic impact on the weeds. Because in organic agriculture, no matter how good your weed management is, your weed management is always gonna be better when you're not growing the cash crop. So you're always gonna have a bigger impact on the weeds in your fields during the time you're not growing your cash crop, right? Because generally, when you're growing cash crop, that's when the weed seed banks increase. You grow corn or, or particularly soybeans, you get a lot of you know, weeds that you can't control, they produce seeds, that goes back down into the seed bank and you've increased and enriched the seed bank. But it's the time periods when you don't have that cash crop growing or you've diversified, right? If you have wheat in the rotation, all of a sudden the period of time that your pigweed would be producing seed it's not producing seed. And so that's how you have the real dramatic. So crop, um, crop rotation is the biggest way that we could impact our, our weed seed banks. Tillage and cultivation is obviously the, 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 the mainstream practice in organic, but there's lots of cultural strategies that we should be thinking about with planting dates and seeding rates and row spacings that have real impact on weeds. We have lots of evidence of these strategies um, having impact on, on weed competition. We're doing a lot of work these days on precision nutrient management. So fertilize the crop, not the weed. That's kind of what we look to do. In corn, obviously that makes perfect sense. In the case of soybeans, we're trying to starve the weed. We want to kind of create a, a very low nitrogen environment. Ideally, if we've got a heavy rye, cereal rye cover crop, we're going to bind up a lot of that nitrogen and the, cover, and if, and the soybean fixes its own nitrogen. And so you create that competitive difference there. And so these are all, things that we put together. Uh, organic management is all about combining tactics. And there's no tactic that's the silver bullet. And, and now in conventional agriculture, there's not really tactics that are silver bullets, you know, with resistance. So, uh, you know, we're, we don't have that chance to, 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 to rely on one strategy. We always have to be combining and thinking about how tactics interact. interact. So another strategy that's coming on, well, we'll cover crops, obviously, and we're going to talk more about that. But another strategy that's coming online, and I hope to be able to showcase this in the next couple of years, this is a piece of a technology that I've just imported from Australia. We're the only ones in the country that has it, and it's called the Harrington Seed Destructor. And this machine attaches to the back of the combine, and this is already now, uh, this is an older prototype. The future, they just came out this year with an, an onboard system. So they're now building these models inside the combine. So there's no long, this is no longer available now. This technology is built inside the combine for just you know, $100,000 at the moment. <laughs> but this basically pulverizes weed seed. Any, all the chaff coming out the back goes into this unit. It pulverizes pigweed seed. It will kill all the pigweed seed coming out of that field and shoot the chaff out the back. Now, this only matters for weeds that have seed that are still on the plant at the time of harvest. 
if the seeds are off the plant, if they shatter, or if they're wind dispersed. But what's our biggest weed issues in organic, at least in this region? I mean, pigweed is a big one, jimson weed is a big one. So those, this is a very viable candidate on. We're just in the process of getting this outfitted. It needed custom connections to a combine, but we have trials at Bark, and hoping in the near future we'll be doing strip trials and demonstration of the potential of coming in at harvest and essentially removing all of the seed bank that's up in those weeds at time of harvest. Uh, I'm gonna skip this slide. I, I, this was just to illustrate the point that as you diversify, you get really good impact on your weeds. So this is a two-year rotation of corn beans, a three-year corn soybean wheat, and this is a four-year where there, uh, um, there's also, well, it actually should be, say, a six-year where there's three years of alfalfa. And you can see the re dramatic reduction in weed cover and, and the reductions in percent loss when you diversify your rotations. And this is, they all, all of this, this, this corn and this, these slides were managed exactly the same. We have the same inter-row, I mean, blind cultivations and inter-row cultivations and same seed lots. The only difference here is that we have much lower seed banks when we diversify that rotation. So it was just really meant to hammer that point out. All right, so now to focus more specifically about what, what do cover crops do with weeds? Well, the majority of what I'll present you data on is on the, this rotational no-till or reduced tillage system that you heard a bit about at the earlier sessions today, right? Because Predominantly, that's the main way cover crops impact weeds. The only other real significant way that cover crops impact weeds is when they're growing. Certainly, a growing cover crop is the most influential way to bang up your weeds. So a winter annual cover crop is certainly going to have big impacts on winter annual weeds that could be a problem in your wheat because they're so competitive and they prevent seed production and growth of winter annuals. But when a cover crop's not growing, uh, then you're dealing with something different. So at, as a living cover crop, this really effective at competing for resources. But at cover crop control, for in case of organic, we're either going to mow it, we're going to roll or crimp it, or we're going to till it. And this certainly has an impact on the weeds. Tillage obviously resets the clock, if anything, that might have grown in the cover crop. Uh, rolling and crimping doesn't kill everything that may have been growing in that cover crop. Particularly, we found ragweed if that emerges early on before you roll, it can hang out there, and that's the, that's the first weed you see in the spring in your, in your soybeans. And then the terminated cover, which is what we're talking about, uh, uh, obviously uh, it, it doesn't have that much effect when you incorporate it. I know that we like to talk about allelopathy as, as a real important tool because we're excited about this, this, this stuff that's going on in the soil. And sure, there is activity, but the activity is, is pretty minor and it's pretty uh, temporal, uh, it's, it's short-lived. We don't get a lot of allelopathic effects, so we don't get these chemicals that are released from the cover crop and it's gonna have this persistent impact on the weeds. And generally, since we wanna delay our cash crops planting a little bit because they can also get sometimes impacted by those allele chemicals right at planting, the benefit from the allele chemicals are not that great. So again, mainly what I'm talking about with weed suppression with cover crops is if you choose to leave that cover crop on the soil surface and grow a big mulch and, and, and roll this down in the case of an organic application. So I, I, I'm not trying to um, I dismiss all of the cultivation, but this talk is all about cover crops and weed management, nitrogen, so I'm not going into all of the different technology associated with blind cultivations and inter-row cultivations and such. And in fact, in many ways, the cover crops can impact uh, tillage-based systems, right? Because we've got to wait for that cover crop to melt down and become friable, and that cover crop can really impact your cultivation and the efficacy of your cultivation. So in some ways, cover crops can be a negative effect on weed management in a tillage system, and it can work in delay management. So roller crimpers, obviously, of what has operationalized this to allow us to do this at big, large production scales. These technologies have basically been adapted from uh, South America, where they've had different types of models. ARS published a version that looked like this many years ago, and then since it's become popularized by the Royal Institute. And these are just some examples of what some of these roller crimpers look like. And uh, this is typically what we've been looking at. We've been looking at Cereal rye going into soybeans and hairy vetch going into corn. There's a lot of folks who have played around with 
You know, they wanted to try triticale because maybe it's a little shorter and stout, but they have some benefits from it, or focused on wheat, or have focused on barley because they wanted earlier flowering. So there's a ton of folks looking at these, and we do a ton of this work too. So we've looked at barley and triticale and all these different covers. By and large, I'm still pretty sold on rye as being the, the best uh, for this system, but I'm, I'm certainly open to being told I'm wrong. Uh, and then in the case of, of corn, uh, we're, we were historically just focusing on a legume because uh, we thought we needed to maximize that nitrogen, but we just ran into so many weedy problems over the years. And again, this is, in the soybeans, we're recommending this. This is part of, uh, part of the agronomy guide for North Carolina State University. Uh, Penn State, you're seeing a lot of folks now recommending this and producers across the region. So this, I think the soybean system is really much more online now. It's something that we feel pretty confident in. The corn, there's still some quirks to work out and we've been working on those. I'll share some of what we've been doing but uh, there, there's a little bit more issues uh, with, with the corn. Um, and so one of the things that we did shift away from is just this pure legume where we maximized nitrogen, but we got very little weed control. And in fact, in some ways we stimulated weeds. And I'll show a slide on that. So we're now looking at grass legume mixtures. In fact, in general, I just think grass legume mixtures are king for so many different purposes because you have two different species, they have two different functions. And when you combine them in different ways, you can achieve your objectives. Uh, depending on how you combine them. Oh, and so I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but this was basically my point, right? You've got uh, grass that sits high weed suppression, but low nitrogen supply. You've got legumes that low weed suppression, but high end supply. So how do we combine these benefits? And how do we maximize productivity? Um, and this is just some examples of, of the old days when we were just trying to get more weight. You know, we were filling these hoppers up and we were putting bags on top just to try to get more weight for cutting. And so one of the biggest issues we had is just getting seed in the ground and getting it placed to a consistent depth so that the corn didn't become a weed to itself, right? If we've got corn this tall and corn this tall, then the corn just becomes a weed to itself and we start to have other concerns. So getting that consistency has been a real challenge. Um, we've looked at a lot of different stuff. We don't. We don't fool with drills anymore. We don't even touch them. We only work with planters at 30 inch or planters at 15 inch with splitters. Um, soil moisture and weight are big ones. If the ground is too dry when you're going to do this, we will yeah. we are find penetrance some. and getting the seed in the ground. If it's too wet, you're just going to push that cover crop right into that slut. So both of those are challenges. So there's, it, it, like in everything in farming, it just has to be just right. Uh, residue quality matters. We've played around with this a lot and I don't really want to go into all the details. We've rolled and then roll planted. We've roll planted and then rolled later. We've rolled and then come in 10 days later and roll planted. All these different combinations of rolling and planting to try to figure out what the residue quality, how wet the residue should be to optimize this. And I've pretty much moved away from this. I've kind of decided that, you know, it's just too much to try to, to, to try to, to cut this residue because the biggest issue is that we get these spring hurricanes. And so these spring hurricanes come in and it just whirls up the field. And so what happens in particular if you have mixtures, but even just pure sur rye, this field of, this stand of rye right here will fall this way. This stand of rye will fall this way. And the next thing you know, you're working with a 2x rate. So you're no longer just trying to cut five to 8,000 pounds of biomass. You have to cut double that. And sure, the whole field doesn't look like that but lots of parts of the field does. The planter then pops up out of the ground and there's this long skip and it's got to get back down to depth. So we've moved away from trying to play around with trying to cut this residue. Uh, uh, and, and I'm not going to go into cultures too much, just that basically you need a straight blade. You can't use anything fluted. It can be bubbled, but you can't use anything fluted. You're just got increasing your surface area of cutting. Um, and these closing wheels, so I, I'll get back into this, the cutting action in a second. These closing wheels, we've, we've really liked these curved time closing wheels in combination with cast uh, closing wheels. We think for particularly in no-till applications, you get better, uh, better uh, kind of better seed to soil contact and, and, and breaking up of that, that th the plane that you smear uh, when you go in there with the double disc opener so we get better closure. Um, but anyway, we've made lots of modifications, and, and I, I'm not saying that we're the, we know how to do it. We, we're, we don't know how to do it. That's why we're constantly changing every year or modifying every couple of years. But this is our latest. So our newest strategy now is that we've put another toolbar in front of the planter. So this is the dry fertilizer boxes, the planters back here, and now we have another toolbar out front with these residue slicers. 
so we get another action of cutting up front. But more importantly, the main action is these trash wheels, these Yetter shark tooth trash wheels. We have very good precision control with those. And now actually Precision Planter makes hydraulic arms that go on these that you can have very precise depth on them. So you could try to manipulate that residue on the surface and move half of it, three quarters of it, all of it, make a wide open band so that you've opened it up. Of course, you've created a space for the weeds to come in. But there's a lot of flexibility, and to me, this is the action. We gotta move the residue out of the way some because we just can't focus on just cutting it or we'll never get precise depths. And there, obviously, the problem is, is, is that um, you, need to, you need to basically balance that, the, how much soil you expose with how much residue you leave in place so that you're trying to you know, minimize how much weeds might come out of that area. But so that's, that's kind of what we've been doing with this. I, I'm happy to talk more about the kinds of results we've had, but that gives you a sense of that. Um, and just to look at how important these mulch rates are in combination with other factors is I wanted to illustrate that point. So right, this is what our weed biomass looks like in pounds per acre uh, when you have just cereal rye mulch increasing but no crop. So there's no crop, soybeans are zero. And this is cereal rye mulch at the bottom. And I, I made this threshold of just below 2,000. That's a very tolerant threshold. Maybe I'm too conservative or, or too generous. You know, 2,000 a lot of, 2,000 pounds of biomass out there's a lot of weeds. But are, we know in organic systems we've got to accommodate more weeds. And, 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 and I would say probably where we start to see yield impact is certainly closer to 1,500. But we can certainly still get very good yields at 2,000. It's really when we get above this level where we start to have a lot of problems. So I'm just using it as a gauge. But you can see once we add soybeans in, at 150,000, we start to find these optimums where we get below these thresholds and get pretty good um, weed control in combination with the cash crop and the mulch. But what I can't accentuate the most is how important it is to increase your soybean populations in these systems. You pretty much can't put enough soybeans in the field. So organic soybean seed is not that expensive comparatively. We have did the calculations a number of times. We've even seen it pay at 300,000 seeds per acre, essentially. I mean, it's just, I know it seems ridiculous, but the amount of weed suppression benefits you get and the cost of these systems, that trade-off is there. So I'm not, I'm not uh, suggesting go out and plant 300,000 seeds, but I am saying that, that we, have, we have not found a population level that we could put out where we didn't get weed suppression benefit and that it didn't pay. So, uh, lodging and soybeans, I mean, or too much, too much plant, I mean, too many plants, <laughs> not, not too much, I mean, as far as yield, like yeah. laying everything over, and have you seen at a certain point you were getting, like, over 200,000, you were starting to see? I would say that when we get up closer to 300,000, we definitely see some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the 200 to 225 range, we, we do pretty good. We have not had that much lodging. Um, so it hasn't been a, a, a dominant issue, um, but well, I have seen launching for sure, yeah. So I'm already way behind schedule on my talk. I have probably 100 more slides to give. But, but, but let's, let's just look at this, because I, th I, I think this is so fascinating. This is V2, V5, V8, R1. So these are just, this is corn getting bigger here on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is weed biomass. And I did this study where I had the blue is 100% rye, and the red is 100% vetch. And if you don't like the words hairy vetch, just substitute Austrian winter pea or clover every time I say the word vetch. Um, but uh, the, 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 you can see that I created all these different seeding rate ratios, right? And look at how amazing this is. At the early growth stages all the way to the late growth stages, just a little bit of rye makes such a difference. This is 20%, where's my, this is 20% rye this bar right here. So the 80, 20, 80% vetch, 20% rye. So this is just a low level of rye in the mix. Now granted, yeah, sure it looks like we got some added weed benefit control. And look at the levels we're at here. These are low. These are not a lot of weed biomass. So already we're getting pretty darn good control in the system. But the difference between obviously 1600 and 600, I would love to be here all the time if I was an organic producer. So, um, you know, just a little bit of rye goes a long way. I mean, there's other reasons to add more rye. Rye, the more you have, the better weed suppression you get. Uh, but from a nitrogen standpoint, you obviously have to balance that. And this is just another year demonstrating that same point. I'm gonna skip through that. 
We have used high residue cultivation a lot as a supplementary tool, particularly if perennials are a problem. Obviously for most organic producers, perennials are not an issue because you've been doing a lot of tillage. Unless you have you know, uh, alfalfa in your rotation, you don't tend to have uh, a lot of perennial weed issues. But, but for supplemental control, this has been really effective and we feel like we've worked out the bugs and it was mentioned even earlier today in the talks. I think, I think that uh, Steve mentioned it earlier or some, about high residue cultivators. They've been really effective and you can leave a lot of that mulch intact. You can get below that mulch and you can get those inter-row weeds that are problematic. And we've, not every year do we see a yield benefit, but every year we certainly see big reductions in weeds. And you all know the name of the game is not dumping tons of seeds back into the soil. So you may not always get a yield return benefit, but you can typically always get a big reduction in the amount of seed bank you're going to dump back in, which is your future problem. And so this is just to illustrate that point in the weed biomass. This is no cultivation versus with cultivation. Um, and then, like, as I was saying, this is yield, soybean yields. And these yields are not that great. And I'm sorry this is not in the... In, so this is like about a, a 40 bushels right here, is about 40 bushels. Uh, and you can see that from no cultivation, no management, just the mulch, we did, and this is just different timings. We came in a couple of weeks versus, you know, you know, three to four weeks after planting versus five to six versus eight to 10. We wanted to find that trade-off. You know, the weed, when you cultivate, before you see all of these weeds, there's no difference in how much weeds are in these early, intermediate, and late. But while there was no difference in the weeds, that's just because we cultivated. But some of those weeds were growing longer than others, right? The early kill, the weeds are out there coming back longer, where, I mean, or the, I'm sorry, the later kill, that weeds have been growing longer. So even though you knock them back at the end and it looks like there's no difference in weeds, they impacted the site more. And that can have yield differences. And you can see here, this is just a hand weeded plot to show you the yield potential. Uh, you can see that the intermediate, these three are not really different. So when it says Bs or Bs and Cs, if they all have a B, that just means they're all the same, but this is a C and this is a B, and you can see that we did get a yield bump with cultivation at this intermediate stage compared to no cultivation. So I'm gonna skip through all of that, and since I only have 10 minutes, I'm gonna probably pick the most important slide to show here, so let me. Um, so cover crops for decomposition and, and nitrogen release, that's the other part of this story when it comes to corn. Um, uh, we, we're trying to obviously uh, mimic when corn is taking up nitrogen. So this is corn taking up nitrogen and this point here like that gross at side dress is when it starts to maximize how much N it's taking up. So we're trying to put our N out there when that's being taken up. And so let's look at that. So when it, this is a no-till and this is tillage. And the difference here is we're looking at nitrogen released. So we're just looking at how fast did the nitrogen come out of the cover crop? And we do a lot of this work, so this is a very simplified version of this, but a big part of my program is looking at the decomposition kinetics of cover crops and developing models to estimate end release. So I'm happy to talk to you guys about this at another time as well. But just look at this here. This is pure hairy vetch. This is mixture of rye hairy vetch, and this is pure rye. And this is how much is N is being released over time. And you can see in a no-till that it's generally a lot slower and in a till, look at this. In tilled ground, when we incorporate that legume cover crop, within 10 to 15 days, the majority of the nitrogen in that legume is soluble. I'm not saying it's leached. I'm just saying it's soluble, meaning it can be leached. So we have to stop thinking about legumes as truly slow release. Those legumes, when they're integrated into the soil, they're tilled in, they decompose rapidly, Bill. You say that's similar to crimson clover? I would. And we'll, we'll, be, we'll be able to share some of that data in the near future. We're kind of expanding to include clover in our studies. But I mean, we're moving away from studying just carbon to nitrogen ratios. And you know, now we're studying quality. So how much cellulose, lignin, cell, cell, hemicellulose, just breaking down the composition of the cover so that we could just broadly make recommendations across any species as long as we know what the quality of it is. Uh, but, but anyway, and it, you can see that you get rapid decomposition and the tillage and, and much slower in the no-till and obviously then you add the grass into the mix and you get much slower end release. Now you do get a little bit less end release for sure but you get slower and better synchrony with end uptake. So that's why from a nitrogen management standpoint these high residue rye vetch mixtures really do well at synchronizing end uptake with corn demand and one of the things that I really like about this is that 
we can basically get to about 50% of that cover crop composition composed of the, the legume and have the same amount of nitrogen as a pure legume. So let me just say that one more time. Just a pure field of hairy vetch is gonna have the same end content as a rye vetch mixture where the vetch is 50% of that mixture. So their, their end content is the same, but the, the release rate is different. When you say 50% of the mixture, are you measuring biomass? Biomass. Okay. Not a seeding rate, your yeah. Your seeding rate's gonna be way different. Yeah, in fact, I, 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 have, I can talk about that endlessly and I'm not going to today, but yes, the seeding rate you put out in the field has nothing to do with what you experience. And that's a whole nother talk. But if you're in a low fertility site, a high fertility so site, the, the climate, all of those affect how a grass and a legume behave. So you can really seed a lot of grass and very little legume and have the legume dominate and vice versa, the opposite. You could seed a very high rate of a legume and a low rate of a grass and have the grass dominate. And that, a lot of that has to do with how fert fertile your site is. Uh, your graph, the total end release, the end release is total or cumulative? That's right. Well, I just, the way I look at it, I'm looking at the tillage cells on the right. Well, the 50-50 um, mix, while you said it probably has the same amount of nitrogen, total nitrogen, um, as the pure hairy vetch, or the 50-50 pure hairy vetch, well, the 50-50 one at least half of it. Right. Right, so that, that's the, 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 while, and this 50-50 mix is a kind of a, a generic 50-50 mix, so I, it, it's not exactly depicting what, what, I, what I would show you if we were looking at hard data of specific biomass levels. But yes, there's no question that the overall end release is less in the mixture over the course of the growing season, but the synchrony is better. And the reason I, I pre I'm presenting all this is because that, the reason we're going in this is we're balancing trying to suppress weeds with trying to supply nitrogen. And so that's why in this system, we need, and I'm gonna not talk about this nitrogen and phosphorus management, so I'm not gonna talk about the breakdown of poultry litter, I'm not gonna talk about the release rates of different poultry litter products, but I'm gonna say that we need nitrogen in the system uh, from another source, and so that's what we've been starting to look at, is how to get that in there how to get more manure into the system. And so this is just proof of concept stuff. This is not production ready, but we've developed, for example, a piece of equipment that can sub su subsurface ban poultry litter at side dress and put down anywhere between three quarters of a ton to three and a half tons of litter per acre. And so allows us to supplement nitrogen to the corn crop. I'm not saying that this is ready to go. I'm not an ag engineer, I'm a biologist. So I'm gonna test, I'm gonna test can we, how does it work and, and can we increase the efficiency and the use? We need the ag engineers obviously to come up with a production scale equipment. I'm using pellets because pellets flow really well. They're a very uniform product and I can get very precise rates where I can study how this behaves, but that's different than what a, a grower is going to need. But this is an ag engineering solution we need, how to get poultry litter in the system. And all I was gonna say is because of earlier, you know, we have regulation now that's preventing us from just surface applying and leaving poultry litter on the surface. And so in these organic reduced tillage systems where we've got, to, we've got to rely on more grass in our grass legume mix, we need to supplement that nitrogen. We gotta figure out ways to get it in there. That was a question. Have you done testing with strip tillage with injecting liquid manure and then trying to plant on top of it? So I've only been focusing, so like my counterparts and colleagues I work with like at Penn State, they work a lot with liquid dairy and look at injections. Uh, you know, for, for me in this region, I felt like it was best for me to focus on poultry litter. So I pretty much exclusively figured on, worked on how to get poultry litter in the ground. Uh, but there are a lot of folks doing injection with dairy uh, manure. In fact, that, one is, that one's hitting the ground running, right? Because injecting liquid is a lot easier than injecting solids. There's so much difficulty dealing with solids and you know, poultry litter doesn't have this uniform moisture content and so it has problems with the delivery system. And, but there are engineers currently working on these solutions as we speak um, and, and they've got, made a lot of progress. This just, look at this band. So this is like four inches deep and this is the plug of poultry litter that's sitting there right below the soil surface. And we can do that at side dress and then cool things can happen. So this is, this is these different cover crops, cereal rye, mixture, and hairy vetch. And this is just the profile of nitrogen. So the greener you get, the more N available is out there. So it's just there's more nitrogen, the greener you get and the lighter the color. And so this is at planting, right? This is at emergence. 
So this is the, what you see here, the end dynamics is just a function of the cover crop, right? So the rye has low nitrogen, the hairy veg has high nitrogen, right? Just because a legume versus a grass. But then we come in at side dress and we band this poultry litter. And you can see what it looks like here. Um, and then this is at silking and milk and maturity. And the thing that I thought was so interesting about this was that we have almost no horizontal movement or I mean, sorry, vertical movement here. You see very little nitrogen leaving the band. When I took soil samples in these bands, it's just covered in corn roots. And the roots are just pouring in there and taking up that nitrogen as it's being released. And so it's, it, it's an option to get the nitrogen in there, and it's a, it's, a, it's a good best management. We've reduced the volatility, obviously, not having it on the surface. You don't have all that ammonia volatilization, which reduces how much nitrogen you put in, which obviously causes more phosphorus concerns. Uh, but we're also getting uptake at the point of the source, and it's not looking like to be as much of an environmental concern as I had. I thought we would just get a ton of leaching at that spot. But because it's slow enough in its release, it seems to be working. So other things we're doing is trying to look at starter fertilizer options, putting in starter fertilizers in the, in the, uh, in the dry fertilizer boxes. We've, the most we've been able to do is work with pellets and put out about 500 pounds of uh, poultry litter, which is obviously only about 10 or 15 pounds of nitrogen f available that growing season. So it's not a lot, but I, know, I hear there's more products coming that are going to have higher nitrogen levels and are going to be more granular. So starter fertilizer boxes and putting nitrogen down at starter, I think is going to become more and more of an option for organic growers. And I think it's an important option to have because we need to get that bump. We need to get that corn gritting out of the ground fast to get that competitive advantage over the weeds. Um, and and I'm, I think I'm already out of time, so I think I'll just stop presenting all these other slides and come here to the end and give you at least a minute to ask any questions. <coughs> Those last few slides, the only major point I wanted to make there is that with a long history of using manure and cover crops, a lot of your soils are building up a lot of net mineralization potential. and so. We need to start backing off on our, our poultry litter applications, period. Most of the farms we've worked with on the eastern shore that have a history of cover cropping and manure should never be applying manure at the, fo at the nitrogen needs. The phosphorus level is all that they need to still get the maximum grain yields that they need to have. But anyway, with that, I know we've run out of time. Right, okay. um, uh, so you can take a couple questions if you want. I just want to make sure that everybody, the CCA, Certified Crop Advisor, football went around to anybody. As a certified crop advisor, make sure that you sign that. That'll be in each one of the wherever you go. So you can take a question or so. Okay. You've had some good discussion. It's a great question in the back. The question, the slide you had with the nitrogen release looked like a hyperbolic curve almost there on the right. Mm -hmm. um, is, that, is there any incidence or increased incidence with root soil borne diseases or fol foliar pathogens in those particular cropping systems? Because sometimes you know, excess nitrogen will trigger disease and disease outbreaks. So do you have any data on that? Can you read these questions? Okay, yeah, so the, I really, yeah, here it is. It is on me. Yeah, uh, so the question was, is, are, are there concerns with disease associated with these cover crop based uh, systems, these real heavy residue uh, on the surface and, 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 and has that impact in the crop? I pretty much have mo only been doing this research in corn and soybeans. Disease has been less of an issue. Um, so I, I think that folks who are working with other commodities or other you know, horticultural crops, that could be probably a bigger issue. But for us with corn and beans, it, it, there, hasn't been a, there hasn't been much concern with disease thus far. Mm -hmm.